My mother had a radical mastectomy. Both her sisters had breast cancer. They have first cousins that had breast cancer. So it's something that my cousins and I, sometimes, not often enough, but sometimes we talk about one of my closest, dearest cousins just battled uh, breast cancer. Right now she's doing well, um, no sign of cancer for about six months now. She's uh, in recovery. And so, praise God for that. The term breast cancer refers to a malignant tumor that has developed from cells in the breast. Over time, cancer cells can invade nearby healthy breast tissue and make their way into underarm lymph nodes. If cancer cells get into the lymph nodes, they then have a pathway into other parts of the body. And this is something that has happened in my mother as well as her sisters. But they did not have reoccurring cancer, but it did go into the lymph nodes. A woman's risk of breast cancer nearly doubles as she has a first degree relative, mother, sister, daughter, who has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Less than 15% of women who get breast cancer have a family member diagnosed with it. About 85% of breast cancers occur in women who have no family history of breast cancer. These occur due to genetic mutations that happen as a result of aging process in life in general, rather than inherited mutations. For women in the United States, Breast cancer death rates are higher than those for any other cancer besides lung cancer. In women under 45, breast cancer is more common in African American women than in white women. Overall, African American women are more likely to die of breast cancer. For Asian, Hispanic, and Native American women, the risk of developing and dying from breast cancer is lower. Besides skin cancer, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among American women. In 2017, it's estimated that about 30% of newly diagnosed cancers in women will be breast cancer. The older you are, the higher your absolute risk of breast cancer. So every decade of your life, it actually, in your, your risk of breast cancer actually goes up. Wow. Your individual breast cancer risk can be higher or lower depending on a number of varying factors, including your family history, reproductive history, race, ethnicity, and other factors. Symptoms of breast cancer. Swelling of all or part of the breast, skin irritation or nippling, breast pain, nipple pain or the nipple turning inward, redness, scaliness or thickening of the nipple or breast skin, a nipple discharge other than breast milk, a lump in the underarm area. These changes also can be signs of less serious conditions that are not cancerous such as an infection or a cyst. It's very important to get any breast changes checked promptly by a doctor. 20 years ago, the best treatment for breast cancer was a mastectomy with radiation and or chemotherapy. Breast cancer tumors now are targeted with a comprehensive array of treatments and the state-of-the-art technology. Breast cancer programs offer advances in radiation, surgery, hormone therapy, and chemotherapy. A multidisciplinary team of cancer, breast cancer experts will recommend treatment options based on the patient's diagnosis and needs. Thank you. Next, we will have a moment to recognize and remember those affected by breast cancer and their loved ones. So if we could have Ms. Lori Wright and anyone else who is present who is a survivor of breast cancer. 
We know that Ms. Patricia Dixon is not able to be with us today, but we think about her today. Ms. Lori, we present you with a gift today. We have a rose for you, and there's a book that talks about coping and healing because we know that this is not a easy process that you're going through. We want you to know that we're thinking about you and that, that we're always with you as you go through this battle. And can you tell us how long you've been battling breast cancer? It's been about total of six months altogether. I just had my surgery last month, and everything is cancer free so far. So. <laughs> We will also ask that people will come forward. We have cards here with ribbon, and we will have you write the names of anyone that you know affected by breast cancer, and we will have it displayed on the tree here. If you don't know anyone affected by breast cancer, you can all also put a quote there, words of encouragement for those who are currently battling breast cancer. We want you to know that also that we will be doing breast self-exams today. So if you don't know how to do your own breast self-exam and maybe you have forgotten and you just want to get some questions answered, will we be doing those in the classroom where Sunday school is held for children? And we have a bunch of materials. So we want to make sure when you guys leave today that you pick up brochures and pamphlets as far as contact information for local resources. Thank you. Young, who's going to bring the word. Amen. Right. Amen. 
also community day updates. Community day is a couple of weeks away. Clap your hands. Everyone has been working very hard to make this day a success. Please pick up flyers to share with the community. Also, continue bringing gently used coats and athletic shoes and see over Royal if you would like to turn those in. Also, make sure you brought your door prizes and things to be included in our gift baskets. And if you would like to sign up to volunteer, everyone needs to sign up to volunteer, please see Deacon Tamika Jones, all right? Uh, lastly, we have the NOAA public meeting speaking loudly. Oh yes, they can. you can see Pastor to volunteer on today. Don't forget about the NOAA public meeting speak loudly on Sunday, October 29th at 3 p.m. at the Temple Church. Also, be sure to go to our regional website to look at the town hall meetings that our uh, regional minister will be hosting throughout this month. Lastly, within your bulletin, you should have received this church membership information form. It is important that we have your information. Even if it hasn't been updated, please fill out this form and hand it to one of the deacons or ushers and they will get it turned into the right folks, okay? Pastor, do you have I do. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, just want to reiterate uh, Community Day. Amen? Amen. Listen, vendors, uh, resource persons from all over the, over the city want to be a part, and we certainly want those who are bringing valuable information to our community to be a part. And so to that end, we are running out of space and tables. So if any of you have a, a long table that we can use on Community Day, please see me after church on today. We need to borrow your table. And if any of you have folding chairs, many of our folding chairs have disappeared. Our brand new black folding chairs, well, they're not brand new anymore. I guess we bought them seven years ago. But they're disappearing by the hands full as well as our old brown ones. So if you look around in the house and you see something that say New Covenant on the bottom of a chair, you know, this is a judgment-free zone. Just bring it on back. But if you have any folding chairs that we could borrow, long tables that we could borrow, we're certainly going to be renting some. But if we don't have to have that expense, and we can use that expense on the community, amen? Because it's all about the community, right? All right. Anybody in here looking to buy a new home? Anybody in here need to buy, want to buy a new home? It doesn't have to be your first home. Anybody here ready to buy another home? Maybe the house you live in, you want to buy another home? There is a program that Wells Fargo has. Now, I was minding my own business. I was in the TJ Maxx. I was not at Steinmark. <laughs> Y'all gave me them gift cards for past appreciation. I was at the Steinmark. I was just looking. And this woman uh, approaches me. Uh, she's here. She was here. She's here in the city from Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has a program, a $15,000 grant to help make home ownership a real possibility. They were downtown yesterday at the Music City Center uh, on Friday and Saturday uh, with this program, giving away $15,000 to help people with their down payment. I mean, you get the entire $15,000. The only string attached, they asked if you could possibly live in the house for five years, but they know that people are so mobile that Sometimes that's not possible, but it's $15,000. It's not just for first-time home buyers. You know, most of the times, most of these programs are for first-time home buyers, but this is, you know, anybody that wants to buy a home. Uh, there are um, some income um, constraints, and so households uh, or, or military folk could make $68,700 if it's just one, two, three, or four of you, seven, eight, Four thousand seventy-nine. You can even make ninety thousand dollars and get this grant. For non-military people, uh, it's from fifty-four thousand to seventy-two thousand dollars that you can make, depending on how many people are in your household. So it's money. It's available. Uh, I'm going to be working with her to hopefully bring this program to our church, to our community next year. 
Um, I think that it's something wonderful that people need to know about. Amen? Amen. I know that Vanderbilt Hospital is helping their employees. They're giving their employees $15,000. And I know that there is a THDA program that gives you $15,000. I don't know what kind of strings are attached to either one of those. Uh, but certainly, um, this is some money that is available, and they're taking this program uh, across the country to share it with people. So I think it's a wonderful thing. So govern yourselves accordingly. Holy House is coming up. You want to make the announcement? Good morning, New Covenant. Holy House is coming. It's on Halloween, so it's October the 31st. If you want to donate candy, come see me. If you want to uh, donate some time to set up or to uh, help host the event, come see me. I'll be more than happy to have you. Um, anything, if you only want to bring one bag of candy, we'll take it. Um, we want to fill up the tub like we usually do every year, so any donations of Candy, money, time, help. We appreciate it. So thank you. Oh, okay. Well, it's for grown people too, because I know we played you know, musical chairs last year. It's a little competitive. But it's an event for the kids. It's a safe place for them to come on Halloween. It's not always safe to be out trick-or-treating. So we want to host this for them. It's a free event. Food, candy, fun, games. Just friends, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, everybody is welcome. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you.
These theories include the belief that the Illuminati secretly runs the world's political and banking systems and manipulate everything from Hollywood to the oil industry. Now don't pull your money out yet, but the symbol of the Illuminati is said to be found in various places of power, including on the almighty dollar, the all-seeing eye symbol mm -hmm, found on the dollar bill, which conspiracy uh, theorists say is a symbol of the Illuminati. Kind of looks like a button. Yeah. yeah, conspiracies, theories. Even now, up to half of all Americans believe world affairs are manipulated by a tiny and malign elite group dead set on building a new world order. Yeah. A world government which dominates the entire planet. Now whether this group exists or not, Webster defines Illuminati as any various groups claiming special religious enlightenment or persons who are or who claim to be unusually enlightened. Now based on this definition from Webster, the ragtag group of disciples who walk with Jesus during his three and a half year ministry and now who claim to be Christians could very well be the Illuminati. Right. To this end, I don't know if the secret Illuminati group that was said to be founded in the 18th century was ever formed, and, and if it was, if it still exists or not, but I do know. <laughs> If by what the they, but by what they enlightened, I don't know what they were enlightened by. But what I do know is this: Christians who are a religious group who claim and rightly so to be unusually enlightened. Jesus says in John eight twelve, "I am the light of the world." He or she who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, to this end, I'm making a claim today that we are the real Illuminati. <laughs> Over 2,000 years ago, after the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there was a group of believers, the apostles, and other followers who huddled together in Jerusalem. The Lord had instructed them to stay there until the Spirit of God descended upon them. Well, we, like all true believers who walk by faith and not by sight, uh, 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 they stayed in that upper room yeah. just as the Lord instructed them. That's what we yeah. do, right? We obey what the Lord says. They stayed there not 10 days, not 30 days, but 50 days. And 50 days later, Pente, which means 50 according to Acts 2, 1 and 6, it was when the day of Pentecost was fully come. While in that upper room, on one accord, suddenly, according to Acts, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it, and it filled the house while they were sitting there. And there appeared unto them a cloven tongues like fire. Yeah. Somebody shout light. 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 And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there, dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this noise was, uh, 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 was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard every man speak in his own language. Why? Because they were filled with the light. Yes. Yes. According to scripture, while those on whom the Spirit had descended were speaking in many languages, the apostle Peter stood up in the midst with the eleven and proclaimed to the crowd that this event that had happened was the fulfillment of the prophecy. 
You see in Acts 2.17 it reads, in the last days God said, I will pour out my spirit upon every sort of flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Peter stated in that sermon that this event was the beginning of a continual outpouring that would be available to all believers from that point on, both Jews and Gentiles alike. Beloved, we are the children of God. And as such, we have the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, we're filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't be scared of the Holy Ghost. Right. The spirit of light is dwelling in each of us. I love the Eastern Orthodox icon of the Christian Pentecost. This icon, and hopefully it's going to come up on the screen, uh, 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 is an icon of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. At the bottom of the picture, you'll see an allegorical figure called Cosmos, which symbolizes the world. Beloved, we are the light of God. And, and, and as such, uh, having the light of God dwelling richly in us, we are illuminated by the light of Christ, not by the light of this world. Right. Right. As a matter of fact, there it is right there. You see the symbol at the bottom? We are illuminated by the light of Christ, not by the light of the world. As a matter of fact, we are the ones that bring light to this dark world. Yeah. 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 And that's why it's important. That the prayers of the righteous storm the gates of heaven. Mm -hmm. It is not our tears. It is not our temper tantrum. It is not our woes that will turn the hearts of God, the heart of God, but it will be the prayers of the righteous. Right. Yeah. And in our text today, Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, immediately after Jesus lays out his blessed be attitude. There, there's a church right there. We visited this church two years ago, when last year, when we were in Israel. This church is built on the Sermon on the Mount. It is the Hosh Herrera Church in Israel. Built there. Matthew records that there on this site, Jesus lifts up two metaphors of how disciples of the kingdom will be known to this world. Today, we focus on the metaphor of light, but the text says they will be the salt of the earth. They will be the light of the world, a light that shines before others. Salt sharpens flavor, but guess what? Light sharpens sight and insight. How many of you know we live in a time when this world needs some insight? Yeah. World doesn't know what's going on. People are wringing their hands, they're walking the floor. What in the world is going on? What is happening? We who have insight, the wisdom of God, should be speaking wisdom these days into these dark situations. Beloved, Jesus is calling his followers and all would-be followers of the kingdom to sharpen the lives of those we come into contact with by, by living on the sharp, the cutting edges, the places where new perspectives, new taste, new vision is embraced. Beloved, this is not a time for safe living. It is not a time for playing is safe, but rather we are called to be out on the front lines of life. We are light in this dark world. We are the light that this world needs. I know. Have been in that situation, but I know that the other day when those bullets rang out in Las Vegas, when the screams and the cries were going forth, yeah. long after the bullets stopped, that somebody needed to hear a word. Yeah, yeah. A word from the Lord. And I'm so grateful because I know, because I know God, that even in that crowd, there were those who were not fearful, those who would stand up and speak a word of hope, a word of encouragement. You always have a witness. Because God always has always. a witness. Yes. Would you be that witness today? Would you be that light today? Hmm. 
this world, this darkness that is evil, pure evil. When light comes in, darkness has to flee. Watch this. Light does not just banish darkness, but it illuminates all the corners, all the crevices. Darkness cannot hide. Light works to provide a new perspective, to put our experiences and our perceptions into a new light. You see, to be a disciple of Jesus, uh, of the kingdom of God, is not just to be a focused being with a laser-like narrowness of intensity. Come on, somebody. But to be a light, the light that Jesus challenged his disciples to be, both past, present, and future disciples, means to continually to put a new light, a new perspective on all the world and to willingly change up the game plan. To shift the paradigms that we are used to living by every day. When light comes in, change comes in. In other words, beloved, when a child of God walks into a situation, when light walks in, darkness changed is changed. The Lord has called us not to get along, not to go along. But to be change makers. Jesus said in John 12, I have come as light into the world that whoever believes in me would no longer abide in darkness. Beloved change makers do not operate in the dark. They don't hide their light under a bushel. When a change maker who is Filled with the light of Christ, walks in, speaks up, stands up, advocates, things change. Yeah. Change comes. Yeah. I was in a meeting this week, Lori and woman who was in D.C. with me when we were in uh, uh, Senator Bob Corker's office. Advocating for Lori to be able to have and other people to have health care, particularly there for my member, who did not have insurance and was going to be denied to have this life-saving breast cancer surgery that she needed. I was in this meeting and a woman who was in that meeting with us in D.C. said, Dr. Cummings, when you spoke, the room got quiet. <laughs> When you spoke, <laughs> attention perked up. Yeah. Well, I didn't take that as a compliment for me. All right. All right. <laughs> but it's when we speak, yeah. Yeah. when uh -huh. we stand up, yeah. when we advocate, <laughs> things are a change. Yeah. Yeah. When a child of God speaks, where there is darkness, the enemy has to flee. Yeah. Woo. We have been given this authority, church. We need to use authority. As a matter of fact, he's not even running again. Congress is he running? Amen. Yeah. And that seat is open. We're going to be praying that somebody with some good sense feels that seat. And we can pray that prayer, y'all. Don't be afraid. Don't just use your prayer for you, your poor, and no more. Pray to change this world. Pray Listen to Jesus' description of the kingdom of God. He says, where the blessed are the poor in spirit, the mournful, the meek, the peacemakers, the persecuted, the childlike, shifts our focus and redirects our light. Mm -hmm. The world would say that they are the marginalized, that they are on the backs of Jesus. said, no, they are the blessed. The Beatitudes force us to stop looking at some big picture of marketable success. Yeah. What the world deems to be successful, a collective to be conquered, and instead look at each person as singular and significant and individual to be embraced. Yeah. Let me see if I can enlighten you and illuminate this truth, this principle. 
Story is told about a business executive who leaves his office late one night. He's tired, he's hungry, he thinks maybe he'll just get some sleep on the train while he's en route to his home. Two stops later into his journey, a father with two young children get on the train car. I think I've told this story before. The children proceed to run up and down the aisle, you know how kids do, uh, making noise and disturbing everybody. And no sleep was possible. The businessman, at first, he fumes, he's upset, he's, he, the anger begins to build, and finally he becomes so irritated with this father for not controlling his children that he gets up out of his seat and he goes to the father and he says, you should really teach your children better manners. Besides, it's just not a matter of behaving badly, but it's not safe for them to be running up and down the train while the train is moving uh, down the aisle. They shouldn't be running. The father took the criticism in stride, and he replied, I'm so sorry. You're right. I should be insisting that they behave better, especially in public. But you see, we just come from the hospital. Where the mother has died suddenly. And the children are in a state of shock. And they don't know how to react. And in fact, I don't even know how to react. So, so I'm not on top of things right now like I should be. So I'm sorry, sir. Uh, thanks for waking me up to my responsibility. Look at it. In one minute, everything changed. From one moment of utterance, the businessman shifted from being angry and annoyed to being sympathetic and helpful. He made a paradigm shift in his perspective. He saw his immediate reality in a new light. Suddenly, that very weary commuter, train traveler was seeing someone the way Jesus sees everyone. Yeah, yeah. Beloved, on October the 21st, community. Community Day. Our community, we're expecting a large number of God's children who live in this community to flood our campus. And yes, you will be tired. Because we started that Wednesday before getting ready, right? You will be tired. But be determined to not just look upon our guests as a focus with a focused beam of light, a, a momentary interaction uh, 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 that we talked about in Bible study this past Wednesday. Don't just rush back on your way to doing something else and say, "Hey, how you doing?" No, that's right. Hoping that they won't respond with a polite, "Oh, I'm fine." You know how we do each other. I hope that on that day, that you not just view people as an inconvenience, an interruption, but as a whole person. The whole spectrum of good to bad that makes up all of our lives. Beloved, as we seek to improve our serve, hear me say this. The light of Jesus calls his disciples to shine out into the world uh, is a light that equally illumines sin and suffering. Mm -hmm. It is a light that knows judgment, come on somebody, yet offers love. It is a light that sees, deserves condemnation, my God, yet extends the commitment of divine comfort. The Reverend Bob Russell was the senior pastor at one of the largest churches in the United States, the Southeastern Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And when I was a seminary student there at Southern, I would often visit that church. Pastor Russell said in a sermon one time, Satan knows your name. Yeah. But calls you by your sin. Yeah. But Jesus, but who Jesus. knows your sin, Woo. calls you by your name. Yeah. That's worth repeating. Yeah. Satan knows your name. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. But will call you by your sin. Yeah. Oh, you know what your sin is. Yeah. Cheater. <laughs> Lazy. Right. Harlot. Mm -hmm. No good. Liar, cheater, uh huh. But Jesus knows your sin. Mm -hmm. But will call us by our name. Mm -hmm. Psalm 103 says this The Lord is merciful 
and gracious. Slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10, he has not dealt with us after our sins, but rewarded us for according to our iniquities. For as, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Verse 13. Like a father who pities his children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Lord pities those who fear him. But he knows our frame. Yet he remembers that we are dust. Verse 17. Mm -hmm. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. <laughs> Upon those that fear him, his righteousness, his chill unto his children's children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Somebody ought to shout, God knows me. Yes. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. He knows our frame, but he remembers that we are dust. Yes. Yes. Isaiah 49, 16, one of my favorite verses. Says, see, I have engraved your name, mm -hmm. tattooed your name mm -hmm. on the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. And I always add, just think how often throughout the course of a day that you look at your hands. That's how often God thinks <coughs> of us. <coughs> Beloved, it's good to know. That that name that is above all names knows our name. And naming is key to our healing. And so not only to our healing, but to those that God calls us to serve. And so on that day, October the 21st, get to know the name of the community. Ask them their name. Yeah. Call them by their name. You may have seen Sister Girlfriend walking up and down Buchanan, but on that day, call her by her name. You may see Brother So and So standing on the corner taking the numbers. We see him every day, but on that day, call him by his name. You may have seen the children running around pulling on car doors to see if a car door is open so they can get changed out. But on that day, oh. call them by the name. Mm -hmm. Remember what the Lord has done for you. Yeah. And with that same grace, with that same mercy, extend it. Yeah. Oh, it'll be a sacrifice. Yeah. Oh, yes, it will. Yeah. Some of them are going to want to hug you. Ah. You smell it like alcohol. Uh. Some of them are going to want to hug you. They ain't had no bad. Let them hug you. You don't have your t-shirt on. Take it home. Put it in the washing machine. This new perspective that this light brings that Jesus gives his disciples helps us to redirect our thoughts, our tasks, our compassion, our love to individuals with names. My God, not institutions, not policies, not bylaws, not instruments with numbers, uh, no about the color of their skin. The light that Jesus gives his disciples enables us to act like little glowworms. Y'all remember the little glowworm? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish that picture come up. You know, they came out in 1982. How I wish uh, my daughter still had her little green glowworm. Because if you Look, if you back up, back up the, the, the thing, that thing is now worth $299. Wow. Uh -huh. But they have another one, you know, they always come up with a newer model, so the newer model is only $9.99. <laughs> but unlike these glowworms, Jesus' light does more than make a bedtime friend or comfort a baby. 
Jesus' light does more than make a lighthouse beacon to be benighted and lost. Jesus' light does more than make us a hallow hallow on a holy hill. Jesus' light infiltrates all levels of the light spectrum, spectrum and gives us a whole new perspective on life. Listen, I'm going to close this sermon. But when we hear the word repentance, mm -hmm. which in the Greek is matanoa, matanao, we think of words like, I'm sorry, forgive me. Teach, Pastor. And we also, those who come to Sunday school and Bible study, understand that word to mean to turn around. Mm -hmm. But repent can equally mean a change of perspective. Mm -hmm. A mind turnaround. A whole new way of looking at the world. To repent, beloved, is to look at the world and each other in Jesus' life. This means three things, and I'm out of here. First of all, it means that Jesus' light helps us to see people as they really are. Instead of spoiled kids that were running rampant up and down the train, when the commuter heard their story, his mind was changed. He saw people who were hungry, who needed to be fed. Children who had no place to sleep. Children who had no mother. Children who had a weary father. But not only that, Jesus' light helps us to see ourselves yeah. in terms of what we could be. Yeah. Yeah. The light of Jesus lets us see what we could be. What God is calling us to be. We're called to be light for the world. But we're also invited to immerse ourselves and transform ourselves into in that light. And to see new visions and new possibilities and new perspectives about our lives. To continue the mission of Jesus. But then finally, the Jesus light offers us a whole new reading on the light spectrum to see people as Jesus saw them. You see, Jesus did, did not want his disciples to see people as they really were. That was only the first step. Anybody can see that. But the disciple who truly embraces Jesus' light, who sees his new illumination on this world, is the person who sees people as Jesus saw them. Jesus never saw a sinner. He never saw a sinner. Never saw a sinner. That's what we see. I don't know where that came from. Jesus never saw a sinner. <coughs> Jesus only saw a sufferer. A fellow sufferer. He never saw anyone as someone who had fallen short. But he saw people as someone who needed help to cross the finish line. Jesus never condemned people. He cured people. And so as disciples, we don't see people as sinners, but as fellow sufferers. We see people who need help being to get across the finish line, whatever it is. We don't condemn anybody, especially those trapped in the slavery of sin. But rather, we offer them the power of the divine. Don't you know, church? Don't you know that the church would be changed? If the church would change her perspective of how she saw people, the world might have a chance. If we would only see other people as Jesus sees them, if we would meet everyone as a child of God, filled with the light of Christ, indeed, we would be the real Illuminati. So today
Today I invite you, church, to come and take the light of Christ out into the world. Out into the darkness of this world as we seek to improve our service. That we might leave here today walking in the light of Christ. If we would do that, this world might have a chance. And so I extend this invitation today. Because there may be someone here today who has not experienced the light of Christ. Come on up, Elder Bill. Who's not been filled with the light of Christ. Christ is waiting on you. He wants to fill you. If that's you today, if you've not experienced the love of Christ in that way, won't you come today? Give him your heart. Let him change you. Perhaps you've already been filled with the light of Christ. You're a baptized believer, but you don't belong to a church. The church you belong to. You haven't been there. You need a new church home. Here at New Covenant, we would love to have you as our new member, as a part of this family. We promise to walk with you, love you unconditionally, help you to grow up spiritually strong and mature. I promise to be the best pastor you've ever had. Won't you come today? We're just little glow arms here. Taking our light out. You're not satisfied in yourself. You're not satisfied in your spirit. You know you need God to change you. Won't you come? Praise God. Praise God.